Good morning, everyone. So, um, Travis asked me to speak this morning, actually, a message that I already gave at the women's breakfast, but it was a small crowd, so I apologize if you were there. This is going to be a bit of a uh, double take. <laughs> but uh, what I'd like to talk about this morning is um, bridging the gap. And so, you know, like being the youth pastor is sort of like one of those things where like, hey, can you talk about like, you know, like bridging the gap? And uh, it's, uh, it's a tricky subject, but it's one that I gave a lot of thought. And um, let me just start by sort of setting the table for you guys. So I don't really feel there is a gap. <laughs> so when it comes to bridging the gap, it's like, you know, reaching... Um, one people group to another or one age group to another and as how do we put in a program or how do you know like okay you need to now figure out a way to figure out how to reach for the Lord all the 14 year old boys in Trenton go and uh, that can feel really daunting and so this this concept or this idea of bridging the gap sometimes can uh, feel a little bit overwhelming but as I was seeking the Lord about it what I really felt was you know this generation that we have is is full of communication it is full of conversation but it's lacking so desperately in connection and that's really the gap it's 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 one heart reaching out to another it's it's the nurture of mothers and fathers to to children or, or uh, aunts and uncles to to nieces and nephews or you know uh, one age group to another it's that it's that nurture it's that reaching out so, just to uh, get started here, uh, my son Hunter is eight years old, and he's a total extrovert. He loves people. He's, if you ask him, be like, how many friends do you have, Hunter? He'd be like, oh, I have like a hundred friends. What are their names? He'd be like, he's really good at, at being friendly, not so good at remember kids' names. <laughs> so, remember the kid with the green shirt? No. Remember that kid, you know? <laughs> Uh, but what he likes to do, we live beside a school, and um, I love it, because it's sort of the height of irony for me, makes me happy on the inside, because I homeschool, and so living beside a school, just sort of one of those things that kind of tickles my sick sense of humor. Um, but he likes to go after school and go uh, make friends. And uh, so recently, not too long ago, we started bringing these friends home. So we started getting these boys. And uh, this one little boy, Owen, he came to the house, and you know Hunter was with him, and we were like, hey, can Owen come over? And I was like, yeah, sure, Owen can come over. So we're hanging out with Owen, and Owen's playing with Hunter, and then you know, supper time rolls around. I'm like, hey, Owen, would you like to stay for supper? And he, he did, so we called his grandma, and he stayed for dinner. And uh, so the next day, and Chris, I mean, Hunter gives this kid like the grand tour of the house, right? Because he's so proud. He's like, look at all my stuff. <laughs> so the next day, I hear little voices outside. And here's Owen. He's got a friend now. And he's like, you're never going to believe this kid's house. It's huge. And there's so much stuff in it. He's got like Disney Infinity. And he's got a trampoline in the backyard. And his dad's a firefighter. And uh, so I hear them coming up. He's like, no, he's not. He's like, yeah, he is. So they come up, and now there's little Owen and little TC. And they're like, can we come over? So sure, why not? So we open up you know, our house, and they're playing. And sure enough, supper time rolls around. And you guys, boys want to stay for supper? And yes, of course they do. I think they sort of timed it. And uh, they stay for dinner, and, and then they leave. Next day comes. I hear more voices. So you're never going to believe this kid, Hunter. He's got a, you know, like a trampoline in the backyard, and his dad's a firefighter, and uh, he's got all this stuff. He's got a lot of cool toys. You got to come and see it. And I look out there. There's a new kid. So with Owen, he's there's our little. And uh, so I hear them kind of walking up the way. The funny thing was, though, was this week, uh, well, that day, sorry, uh, Hunter was at his grandma's house. He wasn't even home yet. He was due home soon. So they got these kids like. Is his dad really a firefighter? Yeah. So uh, I felt it was like a little weird to let the kids in when like I didn't have any kids at home. It's sort of like a no-no. So I just let them sit on the front porch and I brought them some water. And I'm like, hey, kids want a banana? And they're like, yeah, we want a banana because they've been biking. And uh, so I give them a banana. And the, the new boy, is, his name is Nick. Nick is like adorable. He's got a special place in my heart. And... Uh, so we're just waiting around, so we're um, asking him some questions. So I'm like, hey, Nick, do you live near Owen? Because we had walked Owen home the first night uh, after he'd spent dinner because it was late. And he says, yeah, uh, no, well, sort of. I kind of live over the bridge. I'm like, what do you mean? You don't know where you live? He's like, well, 
my, I'm pretty sure my mom and dad just broke up a couple days ago, and I was staying at my grandma's house, and my mom tries to find a new place, and my dad lives over the bridge. <laughs> and my heart just broke in half for this little boy. I just wanted to be like, come live with me, you'll be my son. <laughs> and I realized something is, if you were to ask me, Allison, put together a program for eight to 10 year old boys in Trenton, and go reach them, go. I'm like, <laughs> mm -mm. so administration or organization is not one of those like top tier skills that I possess, you know? And that would make me sort of go into a panic attack. And that's sort of the same thing that happened when uh, Chris and I were called to do a youth group. Uh, I remember it was a few years ago, we had John Finocchio come, and uh, he prophesied over Chris and I that he saw us working with youth. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, the only thing I have in common with teenagers is I was one. And I didn't even like myself when I was a teenager, so <laughs> we're not going back there. And I remember he's prophesying over Chris and I. We were standing over here, and he's like, yeah, I see you working with the youth, and God and I in my head are sort of having this thing. I'm like, mm-mm. Mm -mm, mm -mm. And he, uh -huh. Oh yeah, I promise. No. <laughs> Amen. You know, and uh, it was something that God had to impress upon my heart because to me it was like run a youth group, have youth programs, could you know bridge the gap with the teenagers. And I'm like, I didn't even like myself as a teenager. Teenagers are they smell funny and they're obnoxious and they're like simultaneously hyper and lazy like I don't understand <laughs> I don't want to deal with these people and but the Lord had different plans and so what uh, I found is that as we started doing youth group his grace was there and his heart was there and are my administration skills any better not really are my organizational skills really great not so much but what I can do and what I love to do is be a friend, be an older sister, be a mother to the youth, to, to reach out to them, to nurture them, to listen to them. Those things I can do. And so when we had little Nick at the house, and my heart is just breaking because this poor boy's parents are going through a divorce, and it's so fresh, and he just hung his head so low, and it just broke my heart so much. You know, I just did the best I could to just love on him and to just tell him, you know, this isn't your fault and you can always come here whenever you want. And that's bridging the gap. It's just taking the one person in front of you and loving on them. It's just, it's just putting the nurture out there. And it doesn't need to be complicated. And that's, I'm a very simple girl. I need, I need to know, okay, how does this affect my life? What's the point here? And it's not complicated to just reach out to somebody with the heart of Christ. It's not complicated at all. So what I want to do is I want to get right into it. We're going to open up to Ruth 1. I'm just going to read quickly part of the story of Ruth. Ah, perfect. All right, so now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons. The name of the man was Emelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of the two sons were Malhan and Chilion, Ephrahites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Emelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, her and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab, one was named Orpah and the other one was named Ruth, and they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malion and Chilion also died, and the women survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she may ret might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, her and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. So the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. She kissed them, and they lifted up their voices, and they wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I should have any hope, but I should have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you wait for them until they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters. For it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord goes out against me. 
Then they lifted up their voices and they wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to your people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you, for wherever you go I will go, and with your people I will lodge, and your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried, and the Lord do so with me, and also more also, if anything but death parts you and I. Then she saw she was determined to go with her and stop speaking to her. I'll be like, all right, drama queen. Okay, so <laughs> this is the quick rundown version of the story of Ruth and Naomi, and I really love it. Let's just start right at the beginning. Ruth's relationship with her, her daughters-in-law are good enough that they actually want to go with her. Now, I don't know about you, but does everybody have a mother-in-law where they're like, oh, I want to go with you? Or would you like sort of boot them at the door? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so there's a famine in the land, and the people of Moab are actually descended from Lot. So they're sort of like the outcast of like the weird uncle. Um, if you remember the story of Abraham and Lot, and Lot's wife, she turned around, pillar of fire, turned into salt. They go into the mountains, and um, after a while, his two daughters get him blackout drunk and decide to have children with him to continue his line, and you thought your family was messed up. So what happens is this becomes the people of Moab, and what they had done over time is they had adopted other gods, and, and they had sort of came from Abraham's line, sort of, but had sort of veered away. So they were sort of like the, the outcasts of the Israelite nation. They lived just north of Jerusalem. So when there was this famine, this was a very intense famine. It lasted for a decade. And what they did is they traveled north to go find food. And so uh, the boys, being of age, take wives of the Moabites. So they're actually of a similar family. Now, I want to just take a look at Naomi here for a minute. She has lost everything. She is now a widow. She's lost her sons. And in those days, you, you had no uh, claim to land as a woman. So all of her property, everything that her husband and her sons owned would have reverted to some other family member she may not even have known back in Israel. Not only that, she can't work. Widows weren't seen as very high, much more higher than a slave at those points. They were sort of seen as the dredge of society because now somebody else had to take care of them. And her only hope would be to go back to Jerusalem where she may find some uh, next of kin that may take pity on her and take care of her. But the, the girls would have gained nothing by going with her because there was nothing for them to gain because they themselves wouldn't be allowed much gainful employment. And then without a husband, without children, they would be without honor in that land. So, but I want to focus on Naomi for a second here. She's bereft of her husband. She's bereft of her children. And in her, and she's, she, she thinks God hates her. She's like, God hates me. You know, his, his, his grace has gone away from me. And so she's in her, a very dark place. She's, she's, she's desperate. She's depressed. And at, but at the same moment, she loves her daughters-in-law so much that she says, don't come with me. She was even willing to be alone, to suffer more loneliness for the sake of her daughters-in-law. This is a woman who just poured out love. She's at her deepest, darkest moment, and she's still putting their destinies above her own, in front of her own destiny. She's saying, go back to the land where you can have a husband, you can have position, have your children, and go back to your own country. And they refuse. And so what this really showed me was that it was the relationship between Naomi and her daughters-in-law that was so important that she had, she had invested in them as, she had invested in them as daughters. And so being from Jerusalem, I believe that Naomi was a woman of faith. And so she would have invested in them spiritually, telling them about the Hebrew traditions, telling them about the law, speaking life into them. And when it comes to it, the bond is so strong that they all cry and kiss at the thought of leaving each other because Naomi cared for their destinies. And for me, verse 14 is really key. Orpah realizes that her best shot is to return to her family and remarry, but Ruth clings to Naomi. And although very dramatic, I can just imagine her like holding under her leg, where you die, I will die. And Naomi's like, I get it, get up. People are making a scene. 
But if you, if you look at Naomi, her reason isn't physical, it's spiritual. She says, your God will be my God and your people my people. She wasn't so much interested in what Naomi could give her. Naomi couldn't give her anything, couldn't give her wealth, couldn't give her title, couldn't give her money, couldn't even give her a place to sleep. But she was more interested in who Naomi could connect her to. And she knew that Naomi had the keys to life because she knew Jehovah God. So what ends up happening, because of Naomi's uh, desire to have a relationship with her daughters-in-law and to invest in them, that, they inve that Ruth invested back. And down the line, what ends up happening is uh, they return to Jerusalem. Ruth ends up marrying one of her kin, and she becomes the great-grandmother of King David and therefore in the lineage of Christ. And so that one act of, of just loving on somebody, being a mother to somebody, was so significant to the Lord that he put an entire book in the Bible about it, just so that we could read about the life of Naomi and Ruth, which I think is really awesome. I want to get to, to my core scripture here. It's 1 Corinthians 4, 15 to 16. It says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. I'm going to say, and mothers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul is speaking here. Therefore I urge you, imitate me. So we'll go back to 15. <laughs> so what Paul is saying here is you have 10,000 people trying to tell you what to do. How many teachers do we have? You know, teachers of the Bible, preachers of the Bible, 10 steps to this, 14 steps to this, three ways to that, two ways to this, the wrong way, the right way, up ways, down ways. We have so many instructors, so many people dying to tell us what to do. But where are the mothers and fathers? But we do not have so many mothers and fathers, people who are willing to get down in, in the nitty gritty, to, to get messy, to walk alongside somebody, to never give up, to think the best of someone, to move forward. And so what Paul is saying here is really encouraging the church. He's saying, don't worry so much about instruction, 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 even though that is great and we are to be good stewards of God's word and, and listening to God's word is a very important thing. He says, where are the mothers? Where are the fathers? If you think about it, a, a leader, a teacher, uh, a mentor will reproduce themselves. That's the best you can hope for. So if I, if I was to mentor somebody, the best I can hope for is to replicate myself in that person. Hopefully I'm replicating something good because you always reproduce what you are. Uh, but a mother and a father is different. A mother and a father will sacrifice. A mother and a father will put in hard work and long hours and blood, sweat, and tears to lift their children higher than they could ever go. And you see it especially in people in, in the olden days, in the pioneer days, they would work like 18 hours a day just to you know, raise a barn or to, to forge out, so carve out something for their family for a generation because they understood that generations would come and they would benefit from it. And they would lay down their lives physically and, and emotionally and, and mentally, I'm sure, to raise up the next generation. And how many of you who are parents would do anything to lift up your children so that they could have a higher jumping off point than you yourself jumped off? And that is the heart of the Lord. And I want you to really catch this. Jesus went to the cross, suffered through hell, he conquered hell, the grave, and sin, so that we could be more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. He, it's that same spirit within the Lord that he would go and do something that we couldn't do to lift us up so that we could be higher, start from a higher vantage point than even he started from, a higher jumping off point. So he suffered the cross, and he conquered sin and death so that we could come later and be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we also see that Jesus said, greater things that you will do than I have done, right? So we see that same spirit of our heavenly father lifting us up, raising us up one higher than he himself even went. Just get back to my notes. Sorry. All right, so we're going to go to Psalm 71, 17 to 18. It says, O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. 
And also when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. And I just want to stop here for one second. Now, in church, it's really excited to get excited. It's really exciting to get excited, especially about like youth, young people, because it's so fresh, it's so new, there's so much promise, there's, they're, they're coming up in the ranks, and it's good to be excited about the youth. But what I can find sometimes that can happen is like having two sisters standing side by side. And if I always tell the one sister, you're gorgeous, look at you, you're so beautiful. Man, you're good at everything. You're so strong and so smart and so beautiful. And if I ignore the second sister, by reasonable, um, like, pardon? Sure. She's, she's going to feel... <laughs> <laughs> reasonable conclusion she's gonna feel that she isn't those things because she's not being told she is those things even though I'm not saying she's not those things very well are those things but do you understand if you had you know if you're at work and you're standing you know you line up your boss lines you up and he's always praising you know it's just you and one other guy and he's always saying wow you're you're doing great work and you're just like am I doing great work I go about me and so what I find sometimes that happens in the church, the younger generation gets a lot, of, um, um, a lot of time, a lot of attention. And the older generation can sometimes, by extension, feel that they're not as, as needed or wanted. But what I, I want to say is I want to honor every person here who f feels that they're of an older generation and tell you you are so desperately needed. <laughs> If you're an empty nester or above, let's just put it at that and I won't stick my foot in anything. Um, you are so desperately needed in the kingdom of God. There is nothing that God can't do through you. And even more so, I mean, you may not be going and hacking through the jungles of Guatemala at this age. But we need you to be our mothers and our fathers in the faith. We need you to lift us up. We need you to raise us. That's how we bridge the gap, to lift up one another in the faith. Now, a mother-father doesn't need to be a physical one, as we know. It can be a spiritual mother and father. And sometimes age doesn't matter. I may be a spiritual mother and father to somebody who is the same age or even older than I am in the faith. But the point is, is that we're there for one another and that we are encouraging one another. And we're understanding God's heart is to lift up one another. All right, well, we're going to get to 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 to 8. And I just want to drive this home a little more. It says, this is Paul talking. He says, we were gentle among you just as nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives because you had become dear to us. So here we see that they, were, they said they were coming to them like a mother. They were coming to them with gentleness and tenderness. They were pulling them like a nursing child to the bosom, to the breast, close. You know, you just imagine when you really care for a kid and your heart is you know, out for them and you put their head right here. That's what they're saying. They came to them like a mother. All right, that's like verse 11. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged everyone, uh, every one of you as a father does his own children. That you would walk worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and glory. And here we see, it's just, just jumping down a few verses, Paul is saying we came to you like a father as well, exhorting you, encouraging you, building you up, teaching you the faith so that you could walk worthy of God. And so we see that this, this mother and father theme is, is continuous throughout the gospel. And God is saying... Just reach out to somebody like a mother. Reach out to somebody like a father. Reach out to one another. So there's this really awesome book that I was reading called uh, The Supernatural Ways of Royalty. And uh, they had this one part in it. I'm not sure exactly if this is how it went. But basically, the guy writing the book said that he got saved at a, a connect group. And uh, the leader of the connect group brought him in front of like these, I don't know, they like line them up or what, but in front of these two couples and said, pick your parents. And... Um, so they had these two spiritually mature couples, and basically that was his salvation experience. He got saved, he, he got put in a family immediately. And that really spoke to me, because wow, how amazing would have that been if that happened to me when I first come into the faith. Now, I want to put a little caveat in here. My parents are amazing. <laughs> They're awesome. 
any any questions of faith or an example of faith that I've needed, they've been right there for me. But how many of us know that sometimes we're either too much or too different from our own parents to hear anything they have to say? And so what we need sometimes is many mothers and many fathers to raise us up in the faith. Maybe you have a, a mother and a father that will uh, are strong in faith and another mother and a father that help you financially or maybe another mother and a father that are just there when you need them or another mother and a father that uh, come to your house and clean it when you're too tired because you have six kids. Who knows? But, man, I just thought how awesome that would have had to happen to me. And the thing is, is that God still has the same mandate. He still has the same heart for me to be a mother and father to others. But now it's a little bit harder because I didn't have great examples back there when I first started. But we still have to move on. And we have um, this tremendous capacity for one another to lift each other's up, right? And we're built to look outside ourselves in this way, to, to pour into others. And I want to look at 1 Timothy 5, 1 to 3. Oh, where did we go? There we go. It says, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. Honor widows who are really widows. We're going to go to verse 8. But if anybody does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. If any believing man or woman, a woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened that it, they may relieve those who are really widows. So I just want to go back to verse 8 there for a second. Okay, so God here wants us to take care of each other and to be so good to one another that not doing so is akin to failing the faith. God puts such a high priority on family. God puts such a high priority on reaching out to one another, being good to one another, and showing love to one another. We're all part of the body of Christ. We should be together. And this speaks to me on a really personal level, um, as my mother-in-law is a widow, and sometimes it's hard for me to be there for her. And because I'm so busy, I'm really busy. Sometimes I wonder, this is just too much. But uh, I've been making a lot more effort this year, and God has really been in it, and it's a beautiful thing. And I know at times she may feel like she needs me, but she doesn't understand that I need her more and how much I covet her prayers. And she has the two things that I don't have, time and um, opportunity and, and wisdom. And she, she comes and she knows she does her best to, to take the kids and just like an hour or two of babysitting like a couple times a week is just a godsend. And, you know, sometimes she calls me and she needs something done. And we've all been there. I'm sure we've all been there. Somebody calls you or texts you and they need something done. You're like, I have to do something I don't want to do. But it's really become a joy. And uh, I hope she doesn't mind because she is here. I won't point her out. But um, I just want to share a little story, if she doesn't mind, about the winter. So uh, this winter, God had really been speaking to me about this. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to be there for my mother-in-law. So she calls me on like the coldest day of the year. And it was freezing. It was like 50 below zero. And she's like, I locked my keys out of my, I locked myself out of the house. And I was like, what? So I'm like, where are you? And she's like, I'm outside. I'm like, is the neighbor home? She's like, I think so. I'm like, go to the neighbor's house. I'm like, you're going to freeze to death. I'm like, I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming right now. So I was like, kids, get in the car. And I got like three kids, right? So snow suits and get them into the car and like driving out there. And uh, so I get to her place. And so she's safe and sound at the neighbor's, which made me feel good. <laughs> and I leave the kids in the car with the car on because it's like 50 below zero. It's so cold. She's like, okay, I've got this spare key. It's in the back. And one of those like little like... Um, real estate lock boxes where you gotta punch in the code and then you push it up and you get the key. So I was like, great, no problem, what's the code? So she tells me the code. So I go to the back and I'm like pushing the thing and I go to do it and I don't have gloves because I don't know why but I didn't think to grab them and my hands are like numb, you know. And I'm pushing the thing and I go to push it, it's frozen. I'm like, oh no. So I'm like pushing it and I'm like, i just force it. So I'm like, and it goes Ting! into the snow. <laughs> And I was like, mm hmm. mm-hmm. So now I'm going to like reach into the snow on my bare hands looking for this little like piece. I pick it up. And I'm like, not good. So 
I put it in my pocket. I like run to the neighbor's house. I'm like, do you have any like de-icer or like something I could use? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he gets me this can of de-icer and I run back to the lock. I'm like, I'm like, this is not working. <laughs> so I go back to his house. I'm like, do you have like hot water? I'm like, like a lot of hot water. Like maybe like you could just like boil me a kettle of hot water. So he's like, sure, no problem. So I'm waiting. And he brings me the whole kettle. He just hands it to me. I was like, eh. So I go back to the back door. And I'm looking at this thing. And I've got my kettle of hot water. And I was going to pour it, but then I was just like, you know what? So I just like stuck it in. <laughs> so I stuck in the lockbox. It's sitting in the hot water for a few minutes. And so I then take it out. And then I managed to reattach the little thing. But now my hands are wet, right? So it's like worse because now they're wet and cold. And I'm like trying to put this like tiniest. Why is it so tiny? I don't know why it's so tiny, but it's so tiny. And I'm like, trying to put this little thing in. So I get it in, do the thing get the key. And I was like, yes. And I was like, wait. So I unlocked the door. And I was like, woohoo. So anyways, <laughs> so all that to say is just a fun story. But um, it, it was my pleasure, though, to help my, my mother-in-law. I, I enjoyed it so much, actually. It was a very fun day for me because I sort of felt like a little bit of a hero. So I saved my mother-in-law. And, you know, sometimes we think that helping people is going to require so much of us. You know, it's going to require so much time, so much effort, so much money, so much whatever. But it really doesn't. Just like those little boys that come. You know, I feed them a hot dog, give them a freezy, they're, they're happy. You know, just give them a hug before they leave. Maybe walk them home to show them that, I, that we care. Just let them know, okay, you can, you know, if you need a safe place, you can always come here. And it's that, that mothering heart, that fathering heart that really changes things. It changes people. And, um, you know, some, one time my mother-in-law called me to the house. Uh, she needed help. She just needed a curtain rod put back up. I mean, to me, this is so easy. I stood on the chair, balanced a bit, rod, no problem. But to somebody with a sore knee and a sore hip, it's a big deal. And so we sometimes think that it's this big thing. We've got to put a program together, or this, this giant, you know, five-step series and two-part thing with subroutines and who knows what else is going on. And it becomes so overwhelming. But what isn't overwhelming, what's easy, is just loving somebody, just being a mother to somebody, just being a father to somebody, just investing in somebody, showing a kindness to someone. And that's really the heartbeat. Of, that's, that's my heartbeat. And I feel like it's the heartbeat of God. It's part of the heartbeat of this church. Is, is to just take the time to invest in one another. And so my question to everyone this morning, I guess we're going to finish a little early today. I feel sorry about my husband. We went camping this weekend. I'm pretty sure every bug ever found me. Um, but the, we, li we were on the Madawaska River, and the hill is sort of like this. And so all the up and down, up and down, up and down. <laughs> we're all a little tired, so I go catch him a bit of a break here. But my question this morning to all of you guys, we've got to bring it home somehow. We've got, to, we've got to do something. Okay, so we know God honors those who show honor, right? And we want to be a people of honor, but also show the heart of God and also mother people and father people. And how do we do that? So just ask yourself, has God given you anybody that might be in your path? They may be annoying, but somebody in your path that that you can love on a little. And I'll make it really easy for you. Sometimes God brings people into your path, you know, for an hour. Um, sometimes it's for a couple days. Sometimes it's a lifetime. And you just never know. But the point is, is that God... His grace and his favor is on that because his heart is so for it. He went to the cross to conquer for us so that we could be more than conquerors. And all he asks maybe is to give a small child a cup of water. And we do so in his name. It's like doing the same thing for the Lord. And, um, you know, sometimes he brings people into your life. And you've, you might have somebody in your life right now that you can think of or a couple people that maybe you could bring a meal to. Or maybe you could just sit and watch their kids for an hour. Or maybe you could just um, spend a half hour coffee break and, and ask them what their story is so they get to know something. Or maybe they need um, something moved upstairs or something moved downstairs. Or, or maybe they just need to be shown a kindness so you open the door. It's very, very easy. Sometimes people, God makes it obvious he's, there's somebody in your path and you just have the opportunity to show God's love to them. And then other times we have to go out and find somebody. Sometimes we got to go out and reach the, the lost and the hurting. Or we can ask the Lord, God, 
can you bring somebody into my path that, that I can love on? Now, can, are you going to love everybody at the same time? <laughs> Probably not. But can you love on a couple people or show a kindness to a couple people? Absolutely you can. And just ask the Lord. This is his heartbeat. It won't take long before there's people knocking on your door. <laughs> and even if maybe, you know, having kids in your home might bring the police there because you don't have any kids, you can still invest in people. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you got that. Thanks, Dad. You can still invest in people. Um, there's somebody here, they're going to remain anonymous, but they've decided to give uh, Chris and I some food so that when these boys come around, sometimes they haven't had dinner. Um, sometimes they haven't had a snack in a while. Um, that's often the case. And so what they've done is they've, they've brought us some freezies and some hot dogs and stuff to have on hand in the freezer so when these kids do come over, we can love on them a little bit better, a little bit easier. And so... I just, what I really want to get across to you guys this morning is, is God's heart for mothering and fathering. That is not difficult. It's not hard. It just takes a little bit of time to show a kindness. It just takes a little bit of time to, to love on somebody and then to pray for that person and to really just ask God how you can influence their life for, for Jesus. And the biggest influences of our lives are our mothers and fathers. I mean, I'm sure we've all promised that we would never say or do something that our mother or father did, and there we go, doing it and saying it, because the influence runs deep. And when you can love on somebody as a mother and a father would, it's, it's just, it's something that kind of just comes naturally. More and more, the more we do it. And uh, so just one final thought about the, the importance of it is uh, there's a, I have a quote here from Lisa Bevere. She says, we are not what we do, we are what we pass on. And sometimes we get so busy doing that we forget to invest. And so I want to encourage you guys to invest because relationships are the currency of the kingdom of heaven. They're the only thing that we can take with us. They're the only thing that matter to the Lord is the relationships that we build one to another. And even Jesus, in one of his final acts on the cross, before he died, he made sure his own physical mother was taken care of, right? That was the very last thing he did before he died. He said, here's your mother. He made sure his mother was taken care of before he gave up the ghost. And so I just want to encourage you. And if you're having a hard time, you're like, this is, I don't know what to do. If you're an older woman, and I'm not going to specify what that age is. If you're an older woman, <laughs> just find the most harried-looking younger mom or woman that you can find if she looks tired if she's screaming at her kids if she doesn't look like she's showered recently get to know her maybe just give her an hour or two of your time if you're an older man you know if you see a young man he may look a little wayward he may look a little like you know maybe he could use a hot meal or a coffee or, or just you know someone to talk to just invest a little bit of time and on the flip side if you're a younger woman just find the loneliest, you know, weird old lady you can find or <laughs> spend some time with her. That's all she wants. And if you're, you know, a young guy, just find some old guy that you don't know. Spend some time. <laughs> just kidding. We can all we can all just reach out to somebody in the faith. And I, I have to say, and I want to honor all of you guys here too, I've had so many of you have been mothers and fathers to me, spiritually, through this church. And that's how I know that this is a safe place, because you are my family. And so many of you have spoken into my life in so many different ways you may not know. You know, I have my, my, my fathers in, in music, you know, and I have my mothers in music, and I have my, my fathers and mothers in faith, and I have my real mom and dad, and I have my mother-in-law. And it takes all those people to, to raise someone up in the faith. And so my, um, my challenge for you guys is just to reach out, just maybe if it's an email, <laughs> to your own family and to the church family. And just find somebody to love on and, and show the heart of God in that. All right, well, let's pray. Does everybody want to stand? You've been sitting for a while. Let's stand up. I'm just kidding. Sit down. No, I'm just kidding. Stand up. <laughs> this is not an Anglican church. Come on now. I'm just kidding. All right. Thank you, Father God, for this morning. Thank you, God, for your heart for mothers and fathers. Father, we just 
ask that you would open the spirit of each person here, that you would open our hearts, God, that you would enlarge our hearts. God, that we would look to how we can invest in each other, how we can invest our time, how we can invest our resources, how we can invest a, a smile or, or a glance or, or a moment, God, that we would be so open to receive whoever you would have, whether it would be a little boy for a few moments just to show a, a kindness, or whether it would be somebody living in your house. God, whatever it is, Father, that you would give us your grace, your character, and your mercy, and your love in Jesus' name. Thank you.